Welcome to the Women Consulting Corporate Podcast. I'm Liz J. Simpson, your host. And today you are getting a very special behind the scenes look into really what organizations are looking at when they consider supplier diversity and how to best position yourself for those opportunities. And today I'm geeked up because who best to have as a guest for this conversation than Paul Adamson. Paul works with Amazon. He is a co-president of their global black employee network group. He also works in supplier diversity and inclusion. Separately, he's also an entrepreneur like myself. And what I love most is your mission. So Paul's organization focuses on targeting the wealth gap and financial education. So welcome, Paul. Thank you for having me. It's <laughs> a wonderful introduction. You're over here. I need to record that and send that <laughs> to my you. people. <laughs> We're we going to get you a clip. We got you. We got Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we met in New Orleans at National Minority Supplier Diversity Council Conference. And I have to give you credit because from the moment I had conversation with you, I just felt like you had such a genuine, authentic energy for the work. And I really appreciate that. And be candid, like from one brown skin professional to another, it felt so good to be at a space to see people who look like me, who are actually um, genuinely passionate about the work and putting people in position. One of the things that I really want to do, because when we talk about especially suppliers working with enterprise clients or organizations, I think there's an education gap. So sometimes people hear like flip phrases like supplier diversity, but they don't really know what that means. So do you mind just peeling back the layers to help people understand like what it is you do in your role? What do you focus on? Sure. And, and thank you for that. Like I try to always be authentic in everything I do, um, because like I said, real would recognize real. So always trying to just be myself and be in those spaces. And that's important for us, especially, you know, coming from diverse backgrounds, especially as we move into business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and speaking of what I do for businesses is essentially highlight diverse and small owned businesses and help them be put in the best position to transact with larger companies, right? Especially the company that I work with, but it's external efforts to that as well. So just making sure no matter where you're at in that cycle, whether you're an experienced entrepreneur or you're just starting out, being able to get people to that position where they can actually pitch effectively, win the business, and then grow and scale that business as well. That's just a bar. I just need people to hear that. I don't think enough entrepreneurs realize that organizations actually have their own internal efforts to help put them in the best position. So the question we would get from someone is, why would they do that? Why would all these corporations do that? It's simple, right? So like you use the model working backwards from the customer. So- I work for a company that's like the everything store. So they literally <laughs> sell everything, but that's the core of why it works. Creating customer selection and the more diversity that you have, the more selection that you have. The more selection that you have, the more customers, the greater your scale, the broader your base can be. So that's going to create ultimately you to have the most selection and you can just go to one place. So you don't have to go all these different things and that creates convenience. And that's the second point that people will pay for for most, right? Selection and convenience. So when you do those two things, it only makes business sense. Now, why does it make sense from a social standpoint? It's because you're showing that you're creating equity for marginalized groups. So when you do that, you get three wins in one in one space. So it only makes sense for companies to do it more. We need more people to step up and do this. But like, as you can see, we're starting off the right way. I love it. I understand that this NMSDC was the first time that Amazon was there. It's not. Oh, it wasn't. So it was the first time that we were there at that scale, right? So we came. Okay. It was almost like a rap video. We were like 100 deep. <laughs> Listen, when I say that Amazon showed up, like it was amazing. And what I will say is that from a diverse workforce standpoint, there was the young professionals from Amazon. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I looked around the room and you're like, you know, Spaces like that, you can see how there's different generations there. And I love that I saw a multi-generational workforce. So that was intentional. Okay. So we did that to incorporate diversity across the spectrum, right? So I'm a black man, you're a brown woman, black woman. You right? I'm a black woman. Come on. You can say but it. <laughs> we got to look at diversity across the spectrum. So being a global DI ambassador, like you have to understand, you know, the blacks, the browns, the yellows, yeah. the you know, the identity kind mm -hmm. of diversity as well as gender diversity, as well as sexual orientation diversity. So we were intentional about incorporating all of the different facets of our affinity groups to have that level of engagement, right? And especially like the age piece, right? So mm -hmm. talking about connected to consumers, connected to businesses. So we look at those businesses like our primary customers. Wow. So when you think about connecting to those people, you need to have 
demographics that will be able to subscribe to the people that you're trying to sell to. So if we're trying to sell our platform as a way that we can reach more customers, we need to have people from all age groups and demographics, backgrounds, and walks of life. So we put that together internally. I actually created that program for them, showed them how to structure it, came out with the equity model, like what's the weighting system, who, why we should choose somebody over someone else. And then we got the volunteers internally from the company, gave them training, gave them prep. And then most of the people that you met, that was their first exposure to it as well. So when you guys saw it, that was the first time those people did it. So hopefully you liked the representation that you saw. I loved it. You all stand out, stood out. Like from a brand perspective, that experience definitely, like I have a greater affinity from Amazon because of you all's example, right? So you all are a great representation of the organization because I got exposed to that and I thought, oh, that makes me like Amazon and what they're doing. Um, so I greatly appreciate that. When you talk about that work and your focus in supplier diversity and helping to position organizations, what literally does that look like? Like, what are some of the efforts that you all focus on that you can speak to? <laughs> Man, it's it's a lot, right? So there's high level, like when established companies, which is just getting them to the bidding process, right? Working with our people who actually lead our purchasing efforts to say, hey, you may want to procure from these people versus these people. And here's why, right? Here's the hidden return on investment based on using this diverse supplier versus an incumbent, right? You know, and I have to do like the financial analysis behind that, like cough out, offset, savings, strategic things. But then it could Listen, go- Listen, I want to talk these numbers. I'm trying to behave, y'all. Oh my gosh, I love ROI. Keep going. I'm going to be good, Paul. Keep it, going. But <laughs> it's not always like the exciting piece. Sometimes it's down and dirty. Like people just don't know how to fill out their paperwork and you got to help them people put together their paperwork. It's simple as, hey, I want to pay you. Yeah. I need you to actually like go in here, type in it just like this, like make sure your name appears the same way it does on your website, like stuff yes. like that. Like you would, you wouldn't think you'd have to do that type of work, yeah. but no job is too big. No job is too small. And you got to just humble yourself and help people walk them through because if we don't do it, they may not get that look. And then mm -hmm. just doing it in a way where it's not punitive. We just educating them how to do business better. So that way the next time they come up. They can have a, a greater opportunity at scale, and then they can leverage that to work with other companies. So even on the nonprofit side, we'll, we'll get into that space too, but I got some sauce for you on that oh, too. Oh man. Okay. I'm trying to, I have so many questions I want you to talk about. Okay. So staying in that lane of, okay, supporting them high level from everything from making sure their paperwork's in order, right? To get paid to making sure that you're advocating for some to make sure that certain small businesses and diverse small businesses are in the pipeline. So even with that, when you talk about goals, like how do you all focus on goals or how do you measure that, right? Your efforts. How do you know we're doing a great job and we're on target? Well, I can't tell you about specific mm -hmm, numbers, mm -hmm. but like the mechanisms that we have in place, like I literally work with the team that creates these things. So we have mm -hmm. dashboards, we have accountability calls every day. Like we're tracking this down to the cent, right? Yeah. And we're talking about a significant opportunity, mm -hmm. right? Like. Mm -hmm. If I see it, it's a couple of commas, couple of zeros. I'll put it that way, right? <laughs> right, right. More than a couple. Yeah. Um. So we track it down by company level, mm -hmm. down to like transaction level. Like, and this is not just germane to just Amazon. Like multiple companies do this in different right. ways and facets. But essentially, how it works is you track your spend based off of the supplier, and you can see exactly where how much money you spent with these persons based on how they get certified. And typically, like their certification agencies like NMSDC, mm -hmm. which we talked about being at, or like a WeBank Bank mm -hmm. that people know. But there's even on a state level, there's smaller certificates. So if you're not at that size of scale where you can make that type of twenty five hundred to a thousand dollar commitment, there's state level certifications like on a lower level that you can get. And there's different advocacy groups that are uh, chapters of those larger national imprints, and you can start doing business that way. So like, it's so many different ways to get in, but that's. It's kind of how we, we look at it from our larger scale view. It gives you the ability to really measure and quantify the work that you're doing. And how can an organization best position themselves for like an Amazon? Like what are some things that is like if you're doing this or you're structured this way or positioned this way, these are things that we're looking for. They, so you got to flip the model. Okay. So a lot of times people come to Amazon like, I, I have a problem. My problem is I want to make money. So oh, Amazon give me money, yeah. right? Work backwards and say, what's a problem that I could solve for Amazon and how can I sell to it, right? So for instance, right, you get Amazon products because mm -hmm. that pretty much everybody, in the, mm -hmm. at least 90% of the people on earth buy products from Amazon. 
And how does that come to you in a box? So you think about it as simple as that. Like somebody has to make that box. Somebody had to pay for the sticker and the label. Like where do we get all that stuff from, right? right. You think about those different things and hey, there's a packaging company, right? So package is one of those verticals where you actually source things from people because we don't make the boxes. Right. We buy those boxes and we ship out all of our products in that. So one cool example is that they had um, a packaging company that was next to a, uh, in the Southeast that had um, a plant that we just was starting up in a fulfillment center. We had a local packaging company. They were able to actually be identified as diverse. And from that formulated a relationship based in their local community and they became a regional supplier for boxes. Right. So it's as simple as that. I love it. We um we had a conversation with the woman from iHeartMedia some months ago, and a lot of the women we work with when they're looking to work with larger clients, they're trying to go on the national level. And I love what you just said because she talked about oftentimes there's regional versions, right? Like find a way in your backyard to get involved and build relationships. And when you prove that, okay, you're going to deliver on that, then you can expand the contract from there oftentimes. So I love that you said yeah. that. And it's more so than even just that national or regional footprint. A lot of times we just attack it from the business angle. So the other piece that I come from is that aff affiliate group, um, yes. affinity group space, right? So being a black employee um, in Amazon, we have a black employee network and we have 13 other larger kind of scale groups as well. And there's ways that you can interact with them from a, you know, a DEI space or a community giving space that could lead to a potential business relationship. So all of us in our day jobs actually have functions outside of that kind of volunteerism that we partake in. So you never know who you're interacting with. And that's why it's important that businesses get involved in the community as well with these community leaders, because that can lead to business opportunities on the back end. I love it. For someone who's not familiar with affinity groups, like in my world, we call them ERGs, right? Like the right. black ERGs or what have you. Do you mind just sharing more? Again, just trying to keep it very bare bones for someone who doesn't have that experience. Can you speak to what an affinity group is and what type of opportunities might exist if they're like, how could I add value to my community or to an affinity group? Can you give them some examples? Yeah. So affinity group or ERG was an employee resource group is a group within a company that's uh, surrounded behind an identity, mostly tied into marginalized groups. They're created in a way to give employees a voice and a platform to advocate for their communities that they come from and impact change, right? So each company does it a little bit differently, but the core and the principle is the same. Give voice to the people who need it, right? And be able to organize that so you can actually strategize around doing things. Now, some people strategize better than some, but <laughs> I mean, not right. bragging, but I think we kind of do it the best. Why do you say that? Because I know we we didn't give you credit to that in the um, introduction, but you've obviously worked for other Fortune 500, Fortune mm -hmm. 100 organizations. So Amazon's not the only enterprise organization that you've worked with. But what makes you think that you're doing it the best now? Like what's unique about that recipe? Size, scale, complexity, velocity. You just right? have all these sound bites ready. Like I wasn't, okay, say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Size, scales, complexity, velocity, right? So okay. like we're able to do things globally. Mm -hmm. Right. So a lot of people can't even do things locally. We're doing yeah. things globally. So we talk about the programs and I'll just talk about what I've done. Yes. Let's Not do that. including the great work that all these other people have done before yeah. me or doing with me at the same time. But mm -hmm. we've done programming with the Nigerian ambassador to the U.S. Right. And working with the consulate office. We've done programming with the British Parliament in U.K. Right. We're working with, you know, literally like HBCUs across the country, going to the White House initiative, HBCUs. And actually getting funding and dollars planted. Like one of the coolest things I got to do was help get over $1.2 million cut to Tuskegee University, right? So wow. really create an impact wow. in real time. So the type of stuff that we're able to do for organization that really got reestablished in 2016, globally charted in 2020. And now we're talking about millions of dollars in impact, global connections, like significant political figures in that spaces yes. like abroad i don't think no one else is doing that and if they are doing that they ain't doing it like us <laughs> <laughs> i love it i love it okay programming because i'm gonna ask you all the questions when you talk about programming so you clarify right the funding and money for tuskegee but some of the other endeavors what does some of that programming look like are those initiatives yeah. and then the other thing is how how do you get alignment and buy-in from Amazon, like how do you connect these dots okay. too? So that's a loaded question, right? <laughs> so I'm not okay, gonna- Okay, okay, I I'm, hear you. 
it's no cap. So I yeah. gotta be honest. It's not yeah. like they fund everything. And yeah. They have a funding gap, and trust me, we we we're on them about that. Mm-hmm. But uh, how do we get the money to do the programs that we do? Strategic writing, right? Okay. So the pen is very powerful, and the way that you convey your message is also just as powerful. Yes. So one thing that I did as a finance person and knowing how to work with suppliers and things of that nature, I literally just acted as if I was a supplier. And I came to Amazon with like basically RFPs to say like, hey, here's your problem. Here's a solution. Here's how we can do it. Here's how much it costs. Here's the impact. And then once they had that overall kind of first initial buy-in, then it's okay, here's how we execute, like down to the runner show, lining things out per the minute, who's going to do what to the theme music, to everything, like literally curating the experience yeah. and then how we can do the events, right? So taking like from the financial analytical space to say, hey, here's the bottom line to, you know, the more creative side, like here's how we make the content, here's how we cultivate kind of the vibe and here's how we get people to buy in from that based on data when we do like pre-surveys and different things. So we take in ideas and bring them to life because we know how to write effectively and strategize. I don't even, I just need to let that breathe. Cause that was a masterclass. Like, I don't know if y'all caught, he's saying you lead with the problem. You make sure you understand the problem. And then um, I love David C. Baker, David A. Fields calls it right side up thinking. So you're switching your thinking to look at what are their needs? What's the value for them? What's the impact? What's the ROI? And it's basically a cost analysis, right? So it's, what are the costs that I'm proposing? What's the investment? I like investment because investment means you're yielding a return, right? So, right, here's the investment and here's the ROI you're going to get off of that impact to deliver it. That's brilliant. I love that. I love that you're doing that. And then with the affinity group per se, when y'all, when you talked about a supplier might consider first building relationship with an affinity group, how can they build value? I know you're going to say focus on the problem, but for those who aren't as familiar, how might someone position themselves to really add value or understand what an affinity group is looking at and how they can add value to the programming? So you got to think of it, right? Like we all come from that same struggle. Before I'm an Amazonian, I'm a black man. Right. So what are the challenges that black people have and face? So we attack those things together. Yeah. And then from that, you build relationships. And a relationship is key to the business. So for instance, we met at NMSDC. Yeah. We bonded over a couple yeah. of different items, mm-hmm. not in including this podcast, mm-hmm. right? But because we had so many things in common and we had clear vision and alignment, when you asked me to do the podcast, I jumped up with open arms and said, when and where I'll be there. A hundred percent he did. It's yeah. the same thing that's going to happen in business, right? And most, like they say, from the, modern, the majority culture, right? Most of the deals get done on the golf course. Yep. Where are golf courses, right? We in Atlanta. That's the hookah lounge. <laughs> That's my golf course, right? Right. And the line to get food at Publix. You know, Sundays, yeah. that line is crazy. You better start talking to people. You never yes. know who you're around. And it's just about being personable and just connecting. So before you even get to the structure of an ERG or this and that, it's just connecting as people who come from your similar backgrounds to attack problems. And then it's just about finding those people who are in those positions. And then realizing that we're all more alike than we are different. Yep. So when you do that, you can really build whatever relationship you want to. Or you can stay in your little silo and talk about how specialized and different I am and how no one's facing the same problems as me and struggle mm-hmm. and watch everybody else partner and win, right? <laughs> but like, there's really two choices. But yeah. I choose to do the former, which is just partner, win, and just see how I'm close to everyone and build those relationships. I find so much value in this because um, I love that you talked about realizing the commonalities. We'll have individuals who are wanting to work with corporations, but they'll say, corporations don't understand this and their heads in the sand and nobody understands and nobody sees these problems. And I feel like that's such a naive statement to make. Super naive. And it's insulting. And I'm like, you know, that's probably why you're not landing any, if that's your viewpoint and perspective. And so realizing that organizations have so many great people within their walls who are fully aware of the challenges Mm -hmm. and opportunities. And some organizations better than others are really doing the work to approach and face those challenges. And also realizing that there's this trend, I think, so so few individuals realize how much work is happening behind the scenes by individuals like yourself to create, um, I guess, parity, especially for small businesses. And I think like to your point, right, 
is because people just keep looking at it like a corporation. Like, what is a corporation but a group of people? People. We all so in the business of people. It, it, <laughs> it's not like, oh, like XYZ company. It's oh. No, it's Joe at XYZ <laughs> company who's making that decision. So you need to get cool with Joe. Find out what Joe likes, right? Joe is a person who probably has a LinkedIn profile. Go to his LinkedIn profile. Come on, you might LinkedIn. have a Twitter. Thank you. Drop you might have that. an Instagram. <laughs> Find ways that you can connect with Joe. And then Joe may, because he's cool with you, may help you get good in with XYZ company, right? It's just bringing it back to human element. And I think a lot of us lost that, especially during the pandemic. People yeah. re- forget that you got to be real. Yeah. And if you be real and you make genuine connections, of course you'll make money. The money will come find you. True. And that's the key for suppliers. I would say like when we at these conferences and different yeah. things, like how you met me, this, yeah. there was what, almost like- 4,500 or so yeah. different individual businesses yep. with so many different representatives. Yep. Why did you stand out? It's because mm-hmm. of the personal conversations, the connection points. I have hundreds of conversations every day. These millionaires and billionaires making these decisions have multiple conversations a day. But you know who they're going to remember? That authentic person, that person who said something that caught their attention. And they're going to want to invest time because like I'll say like this, we're more alike than we are apart. Yeah. Like I said earlier, in terms mm-hmm. of the connection point, it's also in terms of like the skill set. Like nobody's really that damn special, right? <laughs> all right. We all pretty close. Yeah. So we even think about businesses, like what makes your business that much greater than someone else's? If you're doing the same thing, you're probably pretty close. Yeah. The difference is your relationship building skills and who knows you and versus who you know. And really being in that space is about how you connect. And if you don't connect, well, it doesn't matter. And a lot of times we don't focus enough on connecting. Yeah. Because the business is going to execute itself. And it's, I think, authentic relationships are the only thing that's really like sustainable, right? That's, if it's not a real relationship, it's not going to last, right? And so I appreciate you saying that because I think, like, also for our audience, a lot of them struggle with this idea of sales. Right. And so when they find out about our brand, because we're known for sales, it's like, oh, I'm going to learn selling. But they expect that we're going to teach like this very transactional, like button up, do this and say this. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't know why I do the robot every time I think of sales. Um, because that's <laughs> like, how people go. That's They're how very people formulate. Think. Like yeah. I do X, Y, I should get Z. Right. But it's more about, again, building comfortability. Like I'm going to sell you something. We all going to sell you something. Yeah. But why should you buy from me? You need to feel one, either you're getting convenience yep. or you feel trust or it's something that's just giving you X amount of value versus the price that you're willing to exchange for this good. And how do you convey that? Right. It all goes back to the same principle. It's about Literally. being real. It's being authentic and making sure that you build that connection with your consumer. So like for instance, it could be as simple as I'm looking around the room like she got on shoes. Why you buy a pair of shoes versus another pair of shoes? Yes. It's really that marketing campaign that makes you feel comfortable with paying that price for that shoe. Yep. And that's all it is. Like you got to be able to market your business in the same way. And that leads to sales. And the best sales, the best ad campaigns are the simple ones, the ones that talk to you and get to your heartstrings in a way that just make it just so easy for you to say yes. Yes. And that's all it is. Come on, masterclass. I like it. <laughs> I like it. So, okay. So I have a, a couple, a couple more questions for you then. If someone is wondering, like for you, when you look to the next year, and I know you can only share so much, but from Mm. what you can share, when you look at your role and your goals for the next year, what are some of the greatest challenges that you consider you might face with where we are in the economy, challenges, your role, however you want to paint the picture, but just to illuminate to us, like what's top of mind for you? What are some challenges on your radar for the next year? That's a good question, right? (laughs) And I have an abundance mindset, so I don't really look at it like a challenge. I just see like opportunities to overcome. So with Let's that, go. Okay. I would say the need to find more diverse and small owned businesses that are either at scale or can scale, right? Since I work with like a large mm-hmm. behemoth of a company, mm-hmm. our needs are a lot bigger, right? Mm-hmm. Like Jay-Z said, like, I need bigger <laughs> plates and more baggies, right? Like, right. <laughs> we got a different type of expenses than the average hustler. <laughs> um, so like, that's kind of our biggest challenges, like finding diverse companies at scale. Um, the second is just the awareness, right? Like a lot of people don't know about this. A lot of people didn't even know this probably exists. This yep. podcast may be the first time someone hears the word supply, diversity, and inclusion. Yeah. So it's about getting that message out, but like being on platforms like this is, is definitely a great way. So I just see like it's opportunity to have more conversations, 
right? That we just need to overcome that that ignorance hurdle in terms of the awareness. Yes. And then the stigma of like people being afraid to do business with big businesses for, for them to overcome that fear so we can have that opportunity. I'm saying, come on down. And not just us. You got the Googles, the Targets, the Facebooks, the, the U.S. government, right? Yes. They the, They're the biggest buyer. Biggest buyer in the block. Biggest buyer in the world. And but it's like every tranche of it. So your state, your local, yep. like there's so many opportunities that if people just go at it with no fear and we can help them get over that fear hurdle, like we can do everything. So that's my biggest challenge, like changing people's mindsets to be like, oh, you can do this. It's really not that difficult. It's a lot of work. Yeah. But it's simple work. And if you follow the process, I guarantee you will win. You may not win immediately, but in the long term, you'll be thanking me. So let's get to work. I just need y'all to hear that they're looking for you. Like one of his opportunities <laughs> to overcome is he needs to find more of you with the capacity and ability to meet the demands of the work they have. Like I don't hear any more excuses in these comments about don't nobody wanna work with small businesses. Like that is not a truth. So speaking of when you talk about ability to scale or at scale, do you mind just kind of um, giving some context to how you identify like, oh, okay, they are at scale or they do have the ability yeah. to scale. How do you frame that? Got it. So like, it depends on the nature of the service or good okay. that we're trying to procure. Mm -hmm. But I'll go back to that packaging example, which we, we talked about earlier, right? Say we have global footprint. People buy goods and services from us across the globe. And we have to put those things in boxes and ship them, <laughs> right. right? So if you could supply us in the Southeast, and we have a need in the Southeast school. And if you do a really good job at a really you know, good price, mm -hmm. we may want to say, hey, can you do this across the US? Say if you don't have an operation in California that could hit the West Coast, or you don't have a space in mm -hmm. like Chicago or something that can service the Midwest, then unfortunately you're going to miss that opportunity. But say if you had the capital to move up into that space because you had this contract with us, you're able to partner with a different packaging company and form an alliance, then you could service us in that space. Cool, we can award you that business, right? Yeah. So those are some of the, the larger scale challenges. But on a smaller scale for like people just starting out, like there's different levels. So like we have like our Black Business Accelerator, which is pretty cool, yes. like for our consumer goods and products, right? So that's, did you, did you create your own custom storefront? Are you legitimized? Do you have like the ability to sell in your state, right? Do you have a, a strategic catalog? Do you have your product descriptions the right way? Are you taking effective photos of your products? Do you have reviews that we can use to amplify, right? Are you doing things on a local level for your certifications? Can we take that and highlight that? Did you engage with one of the local black groups within your city that we could talk about the charitable aspects as well as the kind of business aspects of your company so we can highlight that and put that on a platform, right? So there's ways that we can do this on the large multi hundred million dollar mm -hmm. level until they're just starting out like, hey, girl, I just started a lash company. <laughs> How I sell my lashes, right? Yeah. We, we got it from every angle. And then in the intermediate step, right, we have our AWS accelerator programs mm -hmm. for like people doing tech startups. Mm -hmm. And they actually giving away grant money, like 200 some odd K, right, to actually establish these businesses. So we're hitting it. I like to call it like the ABCs, right? You have your consumer's goods, you have your kind of startup phase, and you have where I'm at in the enterprise level. So- any way you, you want to face it, wherever you're at, like we have a solution to meet you. And I'll, I'll, something that shows up when people think Amazon, they do think a lot of like consumer goods and retail. Mm -hmm. Do you have experiences where you've brought in professional services, whether that's a consultant, a speaker, a trainer, a program um, as well? Because some people think they don't realize that there's yeah. opportunities for that as well. Can you speak to that? Of course. Like for instance, our team, we did a a studies based on personality types, right? Trying to figure out how do we work together. So we have somebody did a neural assessment, but basically tells you like, based on the certain answers to how you deal with certain scenarios, this would be your typical personality type. And they just group it in colors to make it easier for everybody to digest. So we contract mm -hmm. stuff like that, like our marketing campaign for where you met us at, right? Yes. We had somebody do marketing around that and that person taking the pictures and different things. And then putting that package out to see like how do we brand our different diversity efforts within supplier and inclusion, supply diversity and inclusion. How is that being told, right? Mm -hmm. So it's things of that nature. Like we have speakers that come across, which is a big space, especially in the affinity group space. Like 
we hire a lot of speakers to come talk about Pay, best practices. Can I, can I put you on? Um, you, <clears throat> hey, paid or complimentary? Because you know folks be complaining about. Uh... Uh, I'll make sure as, as a black person in finance and a black person who's in this space to help build equity in business, I do my best to make sure that these activities have some type of compensation, right? Okay. Not every engagement will be straight currency, right? Mm -hmm. There's other things that happen, but for the most part, like there's a significant amount of speakers that get paid to come speak. Say that. Right? Like, and we're putting on these events right now. Like I'll tell you what well, real time, like in two <laughs> days from now, we're gonna have three different speakers that are gonna come in and talk about the struggles of uh black women in the workplace and how we can overcome that and do better things as allies to them right whether it be in black men or people that aren't anyone who's just not a black woman right yeah. so like we're paying people to actually come and teach us that right so there's plenty of opportunities professional services whether it be marketing consulting like you name it that we have a whole procurement team for that i love it i just want you to know for sure that somebody's having light bulb moments and you are like changing the trajectory of their business because i don't think enough individuals have knowledge of the opportunities. As we wrap up, you know, I know you're passionate about many different things and you have your own business as well. Anything that you want to speak to that you're like, I don't think enough people know about this and I want to give voice to this or something that you're passionate about. I would say the confidence piece. Okay. Talk right? about it. Like us as a people, especially like speaking to my black sisters, right? Mm -hmm. Like y'all just got to be more confident. You already good where you're at. You'd be surprised how closer you are to actually being at the point where you need to be than how, like, in your mind, how far you think you are, right? So, like, just stop being scared and go for it, right? <laughs> like, that's the best thing I have to tell y'all. And, like, you got people that support you. Like, we want to see y'all win. We may not like how you go about it all the time, <laughs> but at the end of the day, like, there's space and there's people that support you. And if you come with like the things I was talking about earlier with that strategy, understanding the problem, understanding who's the true customer, understanding how to quantify the value, how to create win-wins, then we we can help you guys win. And it's as simple as that. And we want to. So we're here, whether it be on the Amazon front, whether it be on me as a black man just helping black people or non-black people because it ain't just about us like mm -hmm. it's about the collective us it is right it's people that's here for you and i'm one of those people i appreciate you that means so much for real it means so much to know um i've gotten to know you so i know that you are real and so now so many others will be introduced to you and know that they have an ally and advocate in you as well so i appreciate, I appreciate that, that. I hope y'all got as much value out of this episode as I know I did. I'm sharing my friend with y'all. I hope y'all appreciate it. If you want more behind the scenes corporate conversations just like this one, be sure to subscribe at iTunes and on YouTube. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. <laughs>